what is something done universally to greet someone or on meeting someone known? It is not a handshake, but a facial expression, a smile. All muscles of facial expression are supplied by the facial nerve. The seventh cranial nerve is a mixed nerve, but majority of the fibers it contains are motor. These motor fibers supply the face and hence the name. The objectives are that you will be able to describe what the facial nerve is, where it comes from, where it goes to, and what it does. With this knowledge, you should be able to interpret the major symptoms of facial paralysis as well as differentiate between the symptoms of an intracranial and extracranial lesion. I will start with the relevant osteology, move on to a simple schematic diagram of the nerve, and end with the plastinated specimens. On the left temporal bone, I will indicate four features. One, the internal auditory meatus on the petrous part of the temporal bone. Two, this small opening on the petrous temporal, exiting which is the greater superficial petrosal nerve. Three, the stylomastoid foramen between the styloid and the mastoid processes. Four, the petrotympanic fissure for the corda tympani. And now we will move on to the diagram. The facial nerve has a large motor root and a small sensory root called the nervous intermediates. The sensory root has three components, taste, preganglionic, parasympathetic, shown as dotted lines, and ordinary sensations. The two roots accompanied by the eighth cranial nerve enter the internal auditory meatus where they generally unite. The nerve then traverses the facial canal in the temporal bone and exits through the stylomastoid foramen. At this point, it is very superficial in infants as the mastoid process is small and not well developed. Hence, it may be damaged in forceps delivery. The next part of the nerve is embedded in the substance of the parotid gland. In fact, identification, isolation, and preservation of the facial nerve is an important step in parotidectomy. This swelling is the geniculate ganglion where the cell bodies of the sensory neurons are located. I will describe the branches under three headings. Branches in the facial canal. The greater petrosal nerve starts from the geniculate ganglion and goes to the pterygopalatine ganglion in the pterygopalatine fossa. It carries taste from the palate. It also carries preganglionic parasympathetic fibers for the lacrimal gland and mucosal glands in the nose and palate. This is the nerve to stapedius, a small muscle in the middle ear. The muscle dampens the sound vibrations. The corda tympani branches off the facial above the stylomastoid foramen. It traverses its own canal and then comes out to join the lingual nerve. The corda tympani carries taste 
from the anterior two-third of the tongue and preganglionic parasympathetic fibers for the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands. Branches immediately outside the stylomystoid foramen. It gives off two small branches. Posterior auricular nerve, which supplies auricular muscles and occipital belly of occipital frontalis, and the nerve to stylohyoid, which also supplies the posterior belly of digastric. Branches in the substance of the parotid gland. These terminal branches fan out like the spread fingers from the palm to supply the facial muscles. These branches are named according to the region they overlie. One, temporal branches. The temporal branches supply the muscles above the zygomatic, for example, the orbicularis oculi. These muscles closes the eyelid as in sleeping, blinking, or winking, as well as direct the flow of tears across the eye into the nasolacrimal duct. Two, zygomatic branches. These branches supply the muscles below the eye and muscles associated with the nose. Three, buccal. These branches supply the buccinator and orbicularis of. Four, mandibular. These branches supply the lower lip and chin. Five, cervical, which supply the platysma located in the neck. Looking at the base of the brain, note the facial nerve as it is attached to the brain stem. It is accompanied by the eight cranial nerve. Looking in the cranial cavity where the tentorium cerebelli has been cut, note the two roots of the facial nerve entering the internal auditory meatus accompanied by the vestibulocochlear. In this hemisected specimen, in the posterior cranial fossa below the tentorium, note these two nerves entering the internal auditory meatus. These are the facial and the vestibulocochlear. For orientation, note the external auditory meatus, the zygomatic process, the zygomatic bone, the buccinator, which is being pierced by the parotid duct, the cut edge of the mandible, the styloid process, and the mastoid process. Since the mandible and most of the muscles of mastication have been removed, you can see almost the entire length of the lingual nerve. Joining the lingual nerve in the infratemporal fossa is the corda tympani. Here is the parotid gland with its duct. Radiating from it are these branches of the facial nerve. In this specimen, you can see many of the facial muscles. These muscles are attached to the skin and encircle the seven orifices, eyes, nose, mouth, and ears. If the facial nerve is cut, then all these muscles will be paralyzed, resulting in runny nose, tears rolling down the cheeks, and food or saliva dribbling on the affected side. Remembering where the branches arise will enable you to work out which functions will be lost if the nerve is damaged at different points along its course. So, the facial nerve is the seventh cranial nerve. It traverses the internal auditory meatus, 
the stylomastoid foramen and the parotid gland. It enables you to make faces, spit, and cry. Oh my, I hope you learned the major features of the facial nerve.